loving Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear. Why? us to be seated as we continue in prayer and reflection. Listen to the words of Psalm 1. If you'll join me with the words in yellow. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous, For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for this image from Psalm 1 of the righteous person who is like a tree whose roots dig deep into the ground and drink from your living streams. We are not always like those deeply rooted trees. We rush about with weak branches and short roots. And we fail to dig ourselves deeply into your presence and draw from those deep waters. And it is only in the presence of your love that we can truly stand in righteousness. It is only when we found our power and our grace in you that we can love as you've called us to love, that we can be gentle and kind as you've called us to be gentle and kind. And so, Lord, help us to be more like that tree, firmly planted by a stream of living water, And today we would repent of the times that we rush about and neglect to find ourselves rooted in you. Today we repent of the things that we have left undone, the things that we have done 
the thoughts that we have held in our hearts, the attitudes that we have failed to hold, the ways in which we have treated those around us. And ask, O Lord, that as we have sinned, you would have mercy on us and forgive us. And in this moment, we remember that you, Jesus, are the true gardener. The one who looks at the tree that doesn't bear fruit and says, let's water it some more. Let's fertilize it some more. Let's strengthen it. Remember that you are the true gardener who forgives our sins And so we ask, O Lord Jesus, that you would forgive our sins and we hear your words of grace. My child, your faith has made you well. Your sins are forgiven. And we receive the breath of your Holy Spirit as you say to us, go and sin no more. And you fill us with the power that we need to be the people that you've called and created us to be. So we pray together, singing. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and Continue with our scripture reading for today, and I have put the wrong scripture reading up on the screen, and so I invite you to ignore that one as we go to the gospel according to John, chapter 17, and give me a moment to get the right one on my screen in front of me here. John, chapter 17. <clears throat> it's quite interesting when you read the gospel of John. There's quite a lot going on in these chapters that we've been reading from, from John 15 and now to John 17. It's all part of one prayer and speech that Jesus is making to his disciples. And this is uh, just before he'll be crucified. So these are some of Jesus' final words and final prayers for his disciples. So from John chapter 17, we read, Two more seconds from chap- from verse 6. Jesus prays for his disciples. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. and They have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. 
I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word to us. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, we pray. Amen. So, just give me another two seconds. Jesus prays for his disciples. Last week we remembered how Jesus longed for his disciples and for us to share in his joy. He prayed and he asked and he preached to them so that his joy would be made complete in them. His prayer for us and for all people is that we'd experience this godly joy. And the command is that we remain in his love. And I find myself pausing because it's so much to comprehend these parts of John chapter 15, 16, and 17 that I find it hard to preach because, I mean, we just read that part from John 17 and we're in the world and out of the world and praying that they'd be protected and you're going backwards and forwards and maybe a bit confusing. But just a few snippets. I love this part from John 15, 10 to 11. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. The invitation to us is to align ourselves with the commands of the Father. And what are the Father's commands? Well, it turns out from Jesus' teaching that the Father's commands aren't all about religious law-keeping, but about living in justice and mercy and love. These are the commands. These are the words that Jesus has been teaching his disciples as he's preached to them, as he's told them stories of, of parables about justice and God's goodness and all of these things. And in all of this, he uses this language. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. And when I hear that language where it says remain in my love, I think maybe that I will be allowed access and I won't be thrown out. But the other translations and perhaps a a more helpful root of the word is live in my love. Abide in my love or 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 make your home in my love. The invitation that God invites us into his household, so to speak, to live with our roots in God's house and our lives out in the world, remaining in his love and sharing that love with the world. Today we have the privilege of of baptizing a child and We know how hard it is to be parents and how hard it is to be households. But wouldn't it be great if every one of our households was the kind of household that God gives us? 
where we remain in that household of love and we go out into the world to share that love and justice that God has shown us. And what I love about this is the tenderness with which Jesus speaks. Just as I have obeyed my Father's commands, and many people will be questioning Jesus because of the way in which he dishes out mercy and grace. Is he truly a disciple of the Father? Jesus is telling us that he is truly a disciple of the Father. He obeys the Father. He does what the Father has told him to do. And as he does that, he remains in the Father's love. Jesus is enfolded in the Father's love and lives his life into the world in a way that blesses and brings grace and mercy and peace and joy. And he invites us to live in that kind of joy and peace. A reminder that he's going to live in the Father's love. And he's inviting us, his disciples, to do the same and to share in that household. And so as we read John 15 through to 17, we're anticipating the message of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and that'll be spoken of in chapter 16. But also there'll be the problem of, of the trouble that comes when you live in the Father's love, when you abide in Him. This kind of love is too complicated for the world. This kind of grace is confusing in a world that is obsessed with self-love. The Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is not a common concept at the time in which Jesus is speaking. So far, the Jewish people have only known God as, as one. They haven't understood that this oneness of God is composed of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the world of ideas of gods, the ideas of gods are based on our ideas of people and egotistical rulers and kings. The ideas that we have of God are based on our own ideas of ourselves. We, we want to be loved. And we are so egotistical that we don't understand that our true joy only comes in actually loving sacrificially towards others. The Trinity is an example of God's outpouring love. There's no ego at the center of the Trinity. But love is always being poured out. Father loves Son. Father loves Holy Spirit. Spirit loves Father. Spirit loves the Son. Son loves the Father and Son loves the Holy Spirit. And they speak of this dance of the Trinity as the perichoresis. And it's probably been a while since you were allowed to dance and have much fun doing that. But can you imagine three people doing a kind of linking arms dance, where they link elbows and dance around in a circle and then link elbows and dance around in a circle again. And eventually they start going so fast that you can't see who is who in this trio of people dancing in a circle. That is what the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son, the Trinity is like. And we are invited into fellowship with this Trinity in this mysterious prayer that Jesus offers as he condenses this profound teaching into a few prayers and a few sentences and paragraphs for us to understand that we are now invited to abide in him, to live in him, and to take part in that dance of the Trinity, and to know our lives fulfilled by that outpouring kind of love. And that outpouring kind of love is the love that gets Jesus into trouble. The world cannot receive him because they just can't see God as pouring out love in such generosity. In Romans 1 verse 25, Paul says, They exchanged the truth of God for a lie 
and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. We've distorted our idea of what God is like, thinking that God is some sort of egotistical being up there, obsessed with religious observances and multiple sacrifices and about how we belong to this or that tribe or nation. But the God revealed in Jesus is the one of love being poured out, the one of humility and grace. So we've been reading from John chapter 17 about how Jesus says that, that he's coming to the Father, but he's given them a word that's just so complicated for the world. Verse 14 I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. That was the problem with Adam and Eve. They chose to listen to the snake who said you could just have this and then you'll have everything. When the Father wasn't asking us to fill ourselves all the time, but to pour out our love all the time. The world demands that we seek and serve ourselves. But God shows us the way of self-sacrificial love. Because of this love, the world has hated them. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Right now, in the tension of John chapter 17, as they look forward and I'm not talking about that as an optimistic kind of looking forward, but a trepidation kind of looking forward to the crucifixion. I can imagine the devil in the back corner rubbing his hands and saying, I'm getting rid of the goodness of God in a moment. I'm going to show God that the world will not accept this kind of generous love. And Jesus is being taken out of the world. He goes to the cross that because of the love of the Father and the love of the Holy Spirit, Jesus dies on the cross, but he rises again in the power of the Spirit, in the grace of the Father. And evil is defeated, and the way of love is revealed to be the triumphant way of the world. This is the truth. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. And the same promise is revealed for us, the disciples of Jesus, who live in love, who live in this dance of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who will know this eternal dance of God's life and love. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. What is that truth? That truth is the counterintuitive message of God. The counterintuitive message of God's love for everybody, of generosity, of kindness. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And so we are invited in this John chapter 17 to a moment in which we hear the inner dialogue of God, of the Son praying for us, but not just praying for us back then, but as we remembered Ascension Day on Thursday that Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, that Jesus prays for us even now, that we would be sanctified by the truth, that we would be made holy and be made different and be set apart to be a counterculture, sent into the world, but not of the world, learning to live in love. And you know, the world is a funny place because we don't understand generosity. And I thought it would be a funny thing to do something. It's just to check with you guys. Oh, no. Who wants a hundred bucks? You want a hundred bucks? (laughs) 
That's not to go in the offering. That's for you now. How does it feel? Weird, hey? You think I might want something from you. But isn't that a good thing? It feels hard to give away the hundred bucks, I tell you. My wife is going to talk to me later about it. <laughs> but we're just not used to that kind of love and generosity that God wants us to experience and share. To go out and be. To be different. As we baptized young Micah today, he's crossing the river. It's a very small river. It's just in the font over there. It's the River Jordan. It's the river that the people crossed from one reality to another, into the kingdom, the generosity of God. So today, we remember that each one of us has crossed that river too. And we live with a different set of values, a different set of priorities, sanctified, sorry, she. (laughs) Thanks, Heather. (laughs) A different set of values. When babies are small, you don't know whether they're she's or he's. I mean, she's wearing a dress and everything, but I'm getting confused. (laughs) That we live a different life because of God's love in us. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, it's hard to read that prayer in John 17. We get confused because our minds are often clouded by the selfishness of the world we live in. But teach us, Lord, to be generous people. Not just in terms of money or or things like that, but in terms of our heart that is full of your love and ready to pour out your love to the people around us. Fill us with your truth the truth of your grace and your mercy and your peace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so now we get to the point, and I'm not supposed to say the names of babies until baptism, but, you know, it's been a while and I'm excited. And so we come to the point at which we baptize, and give me two seconds because I'm going to have to wear my mask for this part. And also so that we can uh, broadcast for most of, the, most of the baptism, I'm going to have to stand up here and do my speaking. And at some point, I'll have to go down there where those who are watching online will not be able to hear me. There we go. Okay, friends, I invite you to respond with the words in yellow, and this is not just for the parents of the one to be baptized, but for the whole congregation. Baptism is a gift from God, which demonstrates to us the love and grace of God. In baptism, we celebrate the life of Christ laid down for us, the Holy Spirit poured out on us, and the living water offered to us. In baptism, God claims and cleanses us, rescues us from sin, and raises us to new life. He plants us into the church of Christ, sustains and strengthens us with the power of the Spirit. Although we do not deserve these gifts of grace, or fully understand them, God offers them to all, and through Christ, invites us to respond. And so now I invite you, Taryn and Dean, if you'll stand. Having heard these things, how do you respond to the offer of God's grace? Amen. So now we pray together with the words in yellow. Father, we thank you that you have created all things and made us in your own image. 
that after we had fallen into sin, you did not leave us in darkness, but sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. That by his death and resurrection, you broke the power of evil, and that by sending the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new creation. And so we're going to pray over the water, and those who are listening online might not be able to hear what I say. say to Mika Yana Hector, if you'll all join with me, Mika Yana Hector, for you Jesus Christ came into the world, for you he lived and showed Christ love, for you he suffered death on the cross, for you he triumphed over death, rising to newness of life, for you he prayed with God's right hand, all this for you, before you could know anything of it, in your baptism sanitize before we sanitize. going to sing the hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, and then the parents need to come back because they have to make their commitment. Let me see you check it while I find the organist. Are you not going to be allowed to go too far? <laughs> I am my Savior, I'm happy. 
happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. So as you remain standing there, I just invite you guys to respond to the grace offered to your child. I ask you now to respond to God's love and grace to your child by making these promises. Will you love your child, caring for her in body, mind, and spirit? Will you ensure that she is nurtured in the faith and life of the Christian community? And will you set before her a Christian example that through your prayers, words, and deeds, she may learn the way of Christ. With God's help, we will. And I invite you, the godparents, godparents, give us a wave. And everybody, and grandparents, and all those who become part of the team, will you help these parents to nurture their children in the Christian faith? Amen. And then the church, members of the body of Christ, we rejoice that, these are, that this, our sister, has been baptized. Will you so maintain the church's life of worship and service that she may grow in grace and in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. With God's help, we will. Amen. Good job, everybody. It's so exciting to be part of a baptism again after all this time. And so we might as well remain standing as we come to a close of the service, uh, just to remind you that we'll take our offerings on the way out, but we prefer to receive our offerings by EFT because otherwise we have to go to the bank and there's too much sanitizing and stuff for all of that. But if you are, are not able to give by EFT, we thank you so much for your offerings. And so we dedicate ourselves and we pray the blessing. Loving God, we stand as a sign that we commit ourselves to you, to serve you, to be your disciples. And so we ask that you would take our offerings as a sign that we know that everything that we have comes from you, as a sign that we know that our working lives, our family lives, everything that we do is a service to you. So as we move from this place, we ask that you would take us and use us to build the kingdom. And we pray that we would not try and do this in our own power, but like that tree of Psalm 1, rooted in living waters next to you. And so we pray, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. And so now as you move out of the church, I invite us not to... to uh, slow down on the way out, but to go out one by one so that we wouldn't spread any bugs.